It's great to be here with you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 is where we're going to start today. Uh, while you're turning there, let me just say, uh, if we haven't met, my name is Chase. I have the privilege of serving as uh, the lead pastor here at the Corners. And uh, if this is your first time here with us, I want to extend a special welcome. In fact, can we give a shout out to any of our first time guests today? There we go. We're glad you're here. We hope you feel uh, the, the presence of, of the Lord in this place. Uh, we are a church plant, a four-year-old church plant that planted out of the chapel in Akron. Uh, and actually, uh, last week, I, was, I had the privilege of preaching at the chapel of, uh, in Akron. And so uh, I just want to share with you that the church that we planted out of is continuing to pray for us. Uh, they're continuing to, to be excited about everything that's going on here. And we're constantly on their hearts. And I left uh, feeling uh, just uh, like Timothy uh, when Paul says that he's constantly praying for him and praying for the churches, their elders, their pastors, their staff uh, are praying for us constantly, and so I hope that those prayers are felt by you. Uh, if your Bible's open to Daniel chapter 11, I want to read uh, a seemingly obscure passage this morning. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to read, uh, actually, I don't even know how long I'm going to read. I'm going to read until it feels like it's time to stop reading, uh, from Daniel chapter 11, and I want to do something a little different. Okay, so as we're reading Daniel chapter 11, there's uh, this reoccurring theme of the kings of the north and the kings of the south. And so what I want to do is uh, we'll use the camera as the divider. If you're on this side, then when I say kings of the north, I need you guys to cheer. Okay, and if you're on this side of the camera, then when I say kings of the south, I need you guys to cheer. So let's try it. Kings of the north. There we go. Kings of the south. All right, all right, you guys are great. Here we go. So uh, I, I want to try that with this passage, and then I'll explain uh, what's going on. So, uh, Lord, would you bless the reading of your word? Here we go. Usually I ask you guys to stand, but because it's so lengthy, um, I won't do that this morning. Daniel chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 2. It says, And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Verse 5. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. After some years, they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure. But she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times." And from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. And he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their mental images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. His son shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north. I don't know why this is so funny to me. Uh, and he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down ten thousands but he shall prevail. Jump down to verse 40. Verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south <laughs> shall attack the king of the north. <laughs> I messed that up, but it's all right. But the king of the north <laughs> shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. And I think that's where we'll, 
where we'll stop. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for uh, this church. Lord, I pray that you will continue to transform us and mold us into your image. Lord, I pray that I would become less, that you would become greater in this moment. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so you might be thinking, what in the world was all that about? Well, I'll explain that in a second, but since we started in a a little bit of an unconventional way, let me just go ahead and give our outline uh, right off uh, the top here, just so you know we're going somewhere with this. Uh, I want to give you one elementary truth, and that's where we're going to spend the most of our time this morning, two opposite examples, three straightforward reminders, and one necessary response. That's our outline. Again, we're going to spend most of our time in the first part. Um, but, f- but first, I want to ask you a question. Okay, I want to start by asking a question. It's not as good as the mingle time question. That was, that was, I still don't know what that means, but it was awesome. Uh, but here's the question. What is the biggest display of power that you have ever heard of? Okay, just, just think about it. What is the biggest display of power that you've ever thought of? It can be for good. It can be for, for bad. Right, maybe your mind goes to a, a military commander who on a, on a dime can send thousands into battle. Maybe you think of the president who has, you know, the nuclear codes and can start World War III overnight if they want. Maybe you think fictional, right? And Thanos, if you're a fan of the Mar- Marvel Cinematic Universe with the snap of a finger, can just obliterate half the galaxy. Spoiler alert. M- maybe you think of Darth Vader, right? And all the power that he had. Well, w- when I think of power... Uh, specifically uh, earthly power, one of the biggest displays of power that I've ever heard of, uh, comes from a story of a ship captain in the Marines. Okay, this story, I don't know if it's true or not, but I was able to trace it back to Reader's Digest in the mid-90s, and so maybe you've heard this, but the story goes like this. There was a ship captain in the the Marines, and uh, this particular captain was on a ship with a guy who was just always getting in trouble. Okay, this guy's just not following the rules, and on this particular day, the, the, the sailor did something, and so the captain gave him the, the maximum punishment, whatever, whatever that was, redu- reduction in pay or reduction in rank or whatever uh, that might be. And so after giving him this punishment, the captain's chewing him out, and he says, do you have anything to say for yourself? And the young, disrespectful soldier looks at him square in the eye and says, well, you can't take away my birthday. That's right. <laughs> and he said it with a little more colorful language. But the, the story goes that the captain was so mad, right? He, he just kept thinking about it, and he was so mad. So what he did was he figured out when the, uh, when the sailor's birthday was. And so uh, what, this, what the young sailor didn't realize is that they were close to the international dateline. And so as a punishment, Uh, With some careful navigation and timing, the captain had the ship brought right to the edge of the international dateline on the eve of his birthday, and then he had the ship cross over at the exact moment of midnight. (laughs) And so the the captain took away his his birthday, right? That's power, right? To, To be able to take someone's birthday away. Well, it should go without saying that even that power, and really any greater power that we've seen, that we've heard of, that we can even imagine... It pales in comparison to the power of the creator God of the universe, right? E- even fictional power. See, see, the greatest fictional power, superheroes, uh, supervillains, anything like that, really any power that we can even imagine, fiction is really just pushing up against the boundaries of our finite minds. But the God that we worship, as revealed to us in the Bible, he's infinite. So that means he's beyond anything that we can even comprehend or imagine. If you were here last week, uh, Pastor Valmir did an incredible job looking at Daniel chapter 7. Can we give it up for Pastor Valmir? Right, he did an incredible job looking at, uh, at Daniel chapter 7 where we get an Old Testament glimpse into the throne room of God, and God is called the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. It's a, a Hebrew phrase. It's atik yomin is how you say it in Hebrew, and it literally means uh, before days were. Okay, so, so the God who's talking to or revealing himself to Daniel through his visions, uh, he's saying, I've existed before there were even days, before days were. We, we can't fully wrap our mind around the implications of that, 
right? T- trying to fully imagine the power of God is like trying to uh, think of what, what this color orange sounds like. Like, it just, it just doesn't make sense. But Daniel chapter 11, what we just read, I think that gives us one of the greatest insightful snapshots into the power of God. Because what we just read in Daniel chapter 11, and I know it was, it, it was probably difficult to follow and hard to make sense of what we were reading, but, but what's going on is that it's giving Daniel a snapshot of future world events, of events that were future for Daniel's day, and for us, they're both past historical events as well as future events. Okay, let, let me explain what, I, what I'm talking about. So uh, this next slide shows two books. Two books, uh, if you don't like reading or if you don't like history, stick with me just for a second. But if you do like reading and you like history, I can't recommend both of these enough. The first book, uh, How Should We Then Live, has probably influenced my perspective on world history greater than any other book other than the Bible. Uh, But Francis Schaeffer, the 20th century theologian and philosopher, he wrote this in the 70s. And he brilliantly showcases uh, how from ancient Greece all the way up until then modern day, philosophy has influenced music and art, uh, which has shaped and molded culture and ultimately brought us to the current post-Christian culture we're in today. Okay, that's an oversimplification of the book, but I, I can't recommend it enough. And, uh, and, and it's showing how there's, there's these patterns that seem to be reoccurring all throughout history. And so just as an aside, let me say for any teenagers or preteens in the room, uh, everything that you see on social media, whatever it might be, TikTok, whatever, uh, it might seem like people have new thoughts and new ideas, but really there's nothing new. Okay, people are coming up uh, with, with ideas that they think that they're new, and they're really just repackaging ancient thoughts and ideas that they thought that they came up with. But anyway, uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer, he's showcasing how we got from all the way back then to where we are now. And he shows us that all of history is really on a linear trajectory, and it does really uh, indeed repeat itself. The the second book up here is called The End is Always Near. I actually read this one earlier this year, and it's by Dan Carlin. Maybe you've heard of him if you're into podcasts. Uh, He hosts a podcast called Hardcore History, and he's not a believer, uh, so this is not an endorsement of either his worldview or the language that is sometimes used in his podcast. Uh, But the reason I'm mentioning him is because what he's showing in this book is that all of world history is really just the story of societal uh, commencements and obliterations, right? He's showing that every society, no matter how great they think they are, every society, every nation, and every kingdom rises to a point uh, where they might think that they're invincible until they aren't. And it's amazing because from a non-Christian worldview, it seems like all of world history is just chance and chaos. But when you look at it through Schaefer's perspective, which is Daniel's perspective, that there's a God in heaven who's changing the times and the seasons, then we see that it's not by chance, but it's by the sovereign hand of God establishing the set times for kings and kingdoms. Where am I going with this? Well, Well, Daniel chapter 11, again, what we just read, is one of the most dense parts of Scripture. Okay? It's, it's nearly impossible to understand what's going on in this chapter without a history book or some understanding of ancient Near Eastern culture uh, or a commentary. Sometimes commentaries aren't even helpful because one of the commentaries uh, I love for the book of Daniel said this, this chapter might be treated in Bible classes. We do not see how it could be used for a sermon or sermons. Some of you are thinking you probably should have followed his advice. But, uh, but, but, but let, me, let me explain. What, what's happening here in Daniel chapter 11 uh, is Daniel's being shown visions and prophetic dreams about how all of world history is going to play out. Right? Uh, it, we, we said in this series we're taking the, the 50,000 foot view uh, of, of what's going on in the book of Daniel. We're not working through this book systematically necessarily. Um, If you've never taken a deep dive into the book of Daniel, uh, we have uh, a series that we did a number of years ago in our app, and I highly encourage you to listen to that. But what I need you to know is that the book of Daniel is so much more than just kid stories about um, Daniel in the lion's den and his friends in the fiery furnace and all that. Uh, But the book of Daniel really lays out God's perspective or his, his game plan from the time of Daniel all the way up to the time of Jesus and then he jumps ahead to the end times. Okay, if you were uh, with us in the spring, you remember we walked through the book of Revelation. I don't know about for you, but for me that feels like 10 years ago, but that was this year. 
Uh, and what we saw when we looked at the book of Revelation is that God has revealed to us how everything is going to end. Right? That all of world history is, is headed towards uh, a moment where the curtain will close on this world and the new heavens and the new earth will be ushered in. And that's when the real story begins. We're, we're just living in the prequel. Uh, but when we looked at Revelation, we said there, there's a lot of overlap between Daniel and the book of Revelation because in the second half of Daniel, God is laying out his, his game plan for the nations. And so in Daniel chapter 11, uh, we, we see this, this conflict between uh, the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Right? It's showing us these conflicts in ancient Greece and ancient Persia and even the, the Roman Empire. And these were kingdoms that were future for Daniel, but the, the prophecies are clear. It's like he's reading a newspaper of future world events. Again, it, it's hard for us to follow a little bit because we're not scholars of Greco-Roman war history necessarily, but let me, uh, let me show you this. Anybody know who this is? <coughs> Someone said Justin Bieber. Someone else said Alexander the Great. That's right. This is Alexander the Great. Not really. It's, uh, someone took this and, and made it into modern. I don't know. I think that's funny. But uh, th th this, is, this is Alexander the Great. <clears throat> right? Alexander the Great, he, he, he conquered the whole world, and that's why he's called Alexander the Great. And, and so he, he was like nothing the world had ever seen before, but uh, he died, and he didn't name someone to be his successor. <clears throat> and so after he died... Uh, this was his kingdom. Again, this was, he conquered pretty much the whole known world up to that time. But after he died, <clears throat> his kingdom was split into, into four. You had the Macedonian kingdom. You had Asia Minor. You had uh, the, the Seleucid Empire. There was a guy named Seleucus Nicator. I think I pronounced that wrong because that makes it sound like he's from Mississippi. But uh, he, he had this whole kingdom over here. And then there was a guy named Ptolemy who had the Ptolemic Empire. And, and so what happened is that as this kingdom of Alexander the Great was split into four different empires, they were always going to war with each other. And here's the crazy part. Uh, maybe, okay, I don't have a slide for it. But right here in the middle is where the nation of Israel was. Okay, so the nation of Israel is watching these kings to the north and these kings to the south constantly go to war with each other. And what's really interesting is that all of this was prophesied in the book of Daniel long before it actually happened. Let me read this verse, Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 2 and, 2 and 3. We read this earlier. It says, And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Okay, so this is talking about the, the Persian Empire. If you've seen the movie 300, there's a strong king who, who's, who's making it, uh, everybody angry. But then verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. Okay, this was written long before the time of Alexander the Great, but this is talking about Alexander the Great. The next verse says, And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds of heaven but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority from which he, he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to other sides. These, right? It seemed like right as soon as Alexander the Great got to the height of his power, then his kingdom was stripped away. Let me show you one more uh, place where this is mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, this is another vision that Daniel is having, and it says, And the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in its place, of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. Okay, now just in case you think I'm just making this up and trying to draw parallels and comparisons where there's not really any substance there, uh, Alexander the Great, when he was alive, he went into Jerusalem and, and, and the priests and the leaders of, those, of that day took him into the temple and showed him in, in, in the book of Daniel and they said, look, this is you. Okay, so Alexander the Great uh, was, was shown the scripture and he was told that this is talking about him. But, but what's amazing is that this prophecy is taking place long before the events took place. Right? And then in Daniel chapter 5, uh, verse, or Daniel chapter 11, 5 through 39, uh, again, here, here's the map. And we see this is Israel right in the middle. And so everything we just read when we were going back from the kings of the, the north and the kings of the south, it's because these emperor, empires, the Seleucid Empire and the, uh, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, 
were at war with each other, and Israel is trapped right in the middle, right? Now, if we had time, we could look more in detail at all of these prophecies and see how it's reading like a history book. But here's what, here's what I want you to know. If, you're, if you don't like maps and history and all that, then, then come back. Here's what I want you to know. The Bible didn't just foretell this in great detail before it happened, but, but it, 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 it told in great detail how these nations would fight against each other and how the kingdoms would rise and fall. Right, right, think about it. Again, Israel is right in the middle of, of this chaos and this, these, these clashes that are going back and forth. And, and, and it would have been easy for them to think, okay, the, the king of the north is in control now. now. Now it's back to the king of the south. And who should we tie our allegiance to? Right? Is it the king of the north? Are they, are they going to win? But, but, but what they were reminded of, what the people of Israel were reminded of long after Daniel had left, uh, was that God is in control. That God had foretold all of this, and so God is in control, which leads to our first point, our elementary, uh, our elementary truth. Here it is. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? We, we learn about it in Sunday school, that song. He's got the whole world in his hands, but what we need to realize is because God is in control of the whole world, that he's not worried about anything. Right, that he's in complete and total control. Okay, now we'll, we'll come back to this as we uh, bring this home towards the end, but let's quickly look at the next heading. Two uh, opposite examples. Two opposite examples. I want to look at two kings, two kings who were in the Bible, uh, who at first it might seem like they didn't have anything in common. In fact, they couldn't be more opposite other than the fact that they were both kings. Uh, but they both came to this realization right here that God is in control of all. And so the first one is King David. King David. Okay, there's a lot of great prayers and great kings that we could look at um, uh, that realized that God was in control of all. In fact, when I preached last week at the chapel in Akron, uh, I preached on the prayers of King Asa, King Jehoshaphat, and King Hezekiah. These are all powerful prayers where, where they recognize that God is in control of all. But I want to briefly just scratch the surface on two prayers from two vastly different kings. Uh, and the first one is King David. So uh, turn with me real quick to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, if you don't know where the book of Psalms is, just open right to the middle and you'll be right there. Or you can use the Corners Chapel app. King David, Israel's greatest king. Okay? Uh, what I love about King David is you get almost every emotion from him. Right? He, he writes when he's down in the valley and he writes when he's at the mountaintop. And, and it's a constant reminder that, that no matter what situation he's going through, he can lean wholly on God. And so in, uh, in Psalm 18, this is after David has been freed from oppression. He's been freed from Saul, who, if you know the story, Saul has constantly been trying to kill him. And let me just read from Psalm 18. And again, keeping the backdrop of this, this understanding that God is in control of all. Here's what he says. I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. Keep that, keep that phrase in mind, the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I call upon Yahweh who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. I love this. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents, the torrents of destruct, destruction assailed me. You, you, you ever felt like that? I felt like you're just sinking and just sinking down. And, you know, if, if you've ever been to the ocean and uh, you, you swim out far enough, you're going to feel seaweed, right? It, it freaks me out. It's terrifying. I don't know, for some reason, I always think like my foot's going to get caught in it and then I'm going to sink down to the bottom. Well, this is what David is essentially saying. The cords of death encompass me. I feel like I'm sinking. Verse 5, the cords of Sheol, the grave, entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. But look at verse 6. In my distress, I called upon Yahweh. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. Well, we, we could stop right there, right? So somebody needs to hear that this morning, that when we cry out to God, our prayers are not just going into the empty vacuum of space, but they're going straight to the creator of the universe. Our God is a God who hears, but, but then look at this description. Okay, our God is someone who hears our prayers, but now verse 7. Then the earth reeled and rocked. 
The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. He, the thick darkness was under his feet. What, what does that even mean? Darkness is under his feet. He, he rode on a cherub. That, that's an angel, a creature that we can't really describe, and he flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick clouds, dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his cloud. I've asked this before, church, but is this the image of God that you have in mind when we're singing praises to him? Is this the image in our mind when we talk about the creator of the universe? Is this the image of God when we, when we encounter trials in our life and problems? And then I love verse 28. Verse 28 and 29 for it is you who light my lamp, and, and the Yahweh, my God, lightens my darkness. Here we go, verse 29. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. Okay, I already used a Marvel illustration, but I just, another one just popped in my mind. If you, if you remember in uh, the final Mar Marvel movie, Endgame, I say that's the final one because I just pretend like it stopped right there. But, but there's that scene with Captain America. Some of you are going to get this. Some, if, you, if you're not a Marvel person, just hang in there. There's that scene when Captain America is beaten down to the ground, right? And the whole army is coming against him. And what does he do? He stands up and, and he stands as if he's going to face the army all by himself. That, that's what David is saying here, that, that, that by God, I can run against a troop. That by God, I can leap over a wall. This makes me want to run through a wall. Right? He's saying I, what, what Paul says later, that I can do all things. How? Through Christ, who's the one that gives me strength. Translation to what, it's, what they're saying here is we are immortal until God calls us home. Verse 49. For this I will praise you, Yahweh, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Well, what this psalm is doing is it's reminding us that despite our circumstances, God holds the whole world in his hands. And this whole psalm, which is a prayer, is, is so amazing. And it's amazing for, for many reasons, but I want to show you something in the original language that adds to what's going on here. And that's this word. The word yesha. Yesha. It's a Hebrew word. Can you say that with me? Say yesha. It's a noun that means deliverance, rescue, salvation, safety, welfare. When, so, when, when David says later in the psalms, the Lord my salvation. He's saying, Yahweh is my yesha. Well, when he says in Psalm 51, Lord, would you restore to me the joy of salvation? He's saying, restore to me the, the joy of yesha. It's a, it's a noun. It's also a verb, yasha. Can you say yasha? Yasha, again, that's the verb that means to rescue or to, to, to help, to defend, to save, to, to preserve. And so this is used constantly throughout this uh, this, this psalm. And so, so what I want you to realize is that what we're saying, this God who is infinite, this God who holds the whole world in his hand, is also the God who brings Yesha, the one who brings salvation. Okay, now hold on to that thought. We're going to turn to that uh, in our final point. But let me look at one more prayer. And this, again, I said two opposites. We had King David. Well, now we have the prayer of King Nebuchadnezzar. All right, Nebuchadnezzar was the one who went in and 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 destroyed Jerusalem, right? The one who uh, went in and destroyed the temple that David was praying for. It, it seemed like they couldn't be more far, far apart. But in Daniel chapter 4, let me just set the context if you don't know the story, King Nebuchadnezzar is crazy, okay? He's, he's out in the fields. He's like an animal. He's, he's completely lost it. God has taken away his sanity. But Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, I think one of the most powerful prayers in the Bible or, or parts of the Bible says this, at the end of the days, so now this is Nebuchadnezzar talking. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason turned to me. Let, me. let me read that again. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And what did I do? I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. This, this is a pagan king talking. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. 
All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Don't miss the significance here. This is one of the biggest plot twists in the whole Bible. If we're tracing the story of the Bible, God has his chosen people, and his chosen people get conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar. This has got to be the villain of villains. He, he took them out of the promised land, and now one of the greatest enemies of Israel, while, while he doesn't use the same word, Yesha, what he's saying is, Yahweh is my deliverance. It is my Yesha. If, we'd have, if we had time, I would look at all the times in the Bible that people look their eyes up to heaven. Right? David, all throughout the Psalms, this is what we see. Jonah, right, when he was sinking down, he prays a prayer that's similar to the prayer of David in Psalm 18. The book of Acts, the early church. You can read that on your own, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, the church, the early church is trying to figure out what are they going to do, and so what do they do? They look up towards heaven and they pray for boldness. See, the Bible is primarily the story of God's faithfulness by sending a redeemer and an atonement for us. But the Bible is also the story of weak men and women who say, God, you are in control. People who say, God, we feel the heat getting turned up around here. Our back is against the wall, but you've got this. And therefore, because you have got this, we're not trying to get you to join our side in the earthly conflicts and wars. We're joining your side. We're going to serve you, God. You're going to get the glory. See, See, part of recognizing the sovereignty of God is realizing our position before God. And a right recognition of God's sovereignty leads to humility, not, not a humility that turns to timidness, but the opposite. So what do we do with all this? I said at the start of the series that our goal is not to talk about who we should vote for. You know, we're, we're looking at the series with political undertones. It's not about which policies are more important because again, we've said each week what unites us is stronger than what divides us. But let me bring it down to ground level with three straightforward applications. Three straightforward applications. Number one, our king who rules the universe is not dependent on any United States political party or candidate. Now, I know we know this up here. But, but do we really know this, right? Is, the, is this head knowledge, or, or do we live like this? Or better yet, would the world know that we know this by our social media posts, by our conversations, by our one-on-one conversations with others, by our houses when they drive by? Again, I'm not calling for political apathy. I'm not saying that we don't vote. I'm not saying that we don't form opinions on political parties and politicians. I think we should do that and more. But friends, if we find ourselves thinking that the plan of the ancient of days for this country could be thwarted if whatever political party we don't like rises to power, or if we think that the only hope of seeing the gospel advance in this land is if our political party wins, then that's political idolatry. Jesus is neither a Republican nor a Democrat. The lamb is far too beautiful to be twisted into the image of a donkey or an elephant. Which leads to point number two. Our king reigns above all earthly conflict. See, see, when when, when we declare our allegiance, our our primary allegiance to a political party, we're we're forgetting who we are. Again, I want to clarify, I'm not saying we, we don't vote, we should but we're called to be set apart, not to primarily choose a side in the conflict. We have to learn to operate outside of the conflict. Because when the earthly rule and power constantly shift back uh, from the north to to the south in, in Israel's day, were the people of Israel told to now see themselves primarily as citizens of the kingdom that they want to be in power? No. They also were told not to isolate or be apathetic, but they were told to seek the well-being, but they knew that one day there would be a true king on their throne in their home, and that that true king uses the thrones of the nations as his his footstool. 
Friends, unlike Israel in Daniel chapter 11, we are blessed to live in a day and an age when we do have the privilege of having a say in who will be the earthly ruler of the land. But just like Israel in Daniel chapter 11, we also see power shift throughout the years, don't we? Not from the north to the south, but from the left to the right. But God reigns from above it all. I said this a couple weeks ago, but as we see ourselves as exiles in Babylon, right? that's, that's what we are. We said that in, in any culture that's not aligned with Christ is, is Babylon. So our brothers and sisters in Mozambique that are navigating the political turmoil there, they're living in Babylon. We, we here in the United States are living in Babylon. And, and in our culture, our Babylon is marked, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, by radical individualism. And this is true on every side of our Babylonian political spectrum. Right? Our, our culture views the world through a lens of what I believe is right. That, that truth originates from me. And it's on both sides. My body, my choice is but one end of the Babylonian spectrum's version of the other's cry, don't tread on me. Both expressing a demand for personal freedom and resistance to external control. But brothers and sisters, what we need to realize is that submission to the king of kings includes absolute surrender to me and to mine. And that's not cowardice to say that. It's not a lack of boldness. It's the opposite. Do you remember what happened when the apostles figured this all out? When the apostles figured out that they could be filled with the Spirit. This was different than what happened at, at Pentecost because the Spirit wasn't showing up here in Acts chapter 4 for salvation, but for boldness, for empowerment. And what happened is that God took a group of ordinary men and women in the early church and turned them into superheroes of the faith, not because of their awesomeness at all, but because of Christ's awesomeness working through them. On their own, they were nothing. But in Christ, they were everything. What would have happened if that group said, you know, we're going to try and figure out which, which, which party that's in control can, we, we can align ourselves with the most? Bringing it back to today with the political backdrop of our day, when we focus on the fact that God is in control of all, that he's outside of the mess, that he's not in the kingdom to the south or the kingdom to the north. I'm not saying that he doesn't care. I'm not saying that he's a, a, a divine watchmaker God, if you've ever heard of that, that he just got the watch started and then just turned around and left. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, he, he cares that we're going to get there in just a second. But, but when we focus on the fact that he's in control, then we can say with David that therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and roam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying the world is a mess, the world is chaotic, but I'm not afraid of this because I know that in my home there's a place where God is in control, where God is the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Here we go. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, but he utters his voice and the earth melts. Yahweh of hosts is with us. Now think of this picture that we've been painting of God in control of everything. And then look at our final reminder. Our king cares for us more than we care for us. The, the God who has more power than we can comprehend or even imagine, he cares for us. He cares for us enough to send his son into the world for us. And some of you might ca have caught on where I was heading with this, but we looked at the Hebrew word yesha. That means salvation, deliverance. Well, the Hebrew word yesha, or the verb yasha, yasha, it became a name in Hebrew. Anyone know the name? Yeshua. Yeshua. In the Greek, Yeshua is translated as Jesus. In English, it's Jesus. The name Jesus literally means Yahweh is salvation. So, so the God who made everything, the God who rules in throne rooms that we cannot picture, the God who made everything that we can see, made a way for you. And he cares about you and he loves you. 
which leads to our final point, our necessary response to all of this. Declare your primary allegiance to the King of Kings. Maybe you're here today and you know that you're not a Christian. What I want you to know is that Christianity is not about a pursuit of control. It's about aligning ourselves with the only one who is in control. It's about saying, God, I, I, I bring nothing to the table. Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. And so maybe you've never made that profession of faith and said, Jesus, God, I want to I declare my allegiance wholly to you. I want you to be Lord of my life. We're going to have a moment to do that in just a moment. Maybe you're here and you know that you're a believer. You've been walking with the Lord, but you're still trying to hold on to the control of your life. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your, your parenting, whatever it might be. You're trying to do things your way instead of the ways that God commands us to do. We're going to have a moment to lay that down before the cross as we declare our allegiance to King Jesus. Maybe you have idols in your life. Maybe your job is your idol. Maybe your kids are your idol. Maybe politics are your idol, and you find yourself finding security in those and having children and what political party is, seems to be in control. We're going to have a moment to lay that down. Or maybe you're just struggling with a, a lack of direction and clarity. Maybe you feel like you're at a crossroads and there's decisions that need to be made in your life. Maybe you are struggling with a certain sin that you know you need to refrain from, but we're going to have a moment to lay all of that down in just a second. And so here, here's what I want to do. We're going to have a moment of prayer. As we come to the end of this series and prepare to head into our series in the fall, through the rest of the fall on discipleship, we're going to have a, a, an opportunity to declare our allegiance to King Jesus. And so here's what I want to ask you to do. We're going to sing a song. It's a, uh, it's a new song to us, but it's a song that has taken over the global stage uh, over the last several years. And it's a song that repeats the name Yeshua, the name of Jesus. And I know sometimes we think, oh, we don't, we don't want to sing songs that are too repetitive. Well, then we might have a problem in heaven because they're singing the same thing over and over day and night. But I want to use this to really focus on what these words are saying. It's going to repeat Yeshua, and then it's going to repeat a verse from Song of Songs. I think it's chapter 5, verse 10, where, where it says in that book, My beloved is more beautiful than thousands. And if, uh, if you were with us last year when we worked through the, the Bible and we looked at the book of Song of Songs, I said that that book is, is multi-layered and there, there's a couple that's singing that to each other in the book, but it's also God singing that to us and us singing that back to God. And so that's what we're going to do. But what I want to ask you is not to stand immediately, but to use this moment as a time to prepare your hearts, to search your hearts, to ask the Lord to reveal to you your blind spots. And then maybe what you need to do to, during this time is to come up to the front and to, to kneel before the altar, to pray, to, to lay down idols, to lay down concerns. You're going to have a moment to do that. But what I want you to do is to reflect, and then when you feel ready, then stand and sing. And as we sing these words, we are declaring allegiance to the King of Kings. As our music team comes back up to prepare to lead us, I want to end with two quotes. Two quotes that really summarize this, uh, this series. The first one is this. It's by C.S. Lewis. It's a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to read it. It says this, If you read history... If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought the most about the next. He says, the apostles themselves who set on the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built the Middle Ages, or the, yeah, built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. He says, if it, 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 it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. 
So, so what he's saying is that when you look all throughout history, the ones who made the most impact were Christians who were focused on their eternal home, but God allowed them to have influence and leave a legacy here as well. And his final line, he says, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Brothers and sisters, where's our perspective? Are we focused primarily on what's going on around us? Or are we like Nebuchadnezzar lifting our eyes to heaven? Before I read the last quote, I want you to close your eyes to picture a kingdom, a large kingdom with a large throne room. And now it's the middle of the night in this kingdom. The king is sleeping. The guards, the bodyguards are all out there. This guy has total power, total control. And then now look at this quote. The only person who dares wake a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. Friends, the creator of the universe, the God who reigns in heaven, loves you. And he loves you too much to allow you to just continue to be concerned with what's going on here. But he wants to call you to lift your eyes to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world, they won't just disappear. We're still going to have problems until Jesus comes back. But the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. King Jesus, you are in control. Father, we are not. We think we are. Lord, would you work in our hearts in this moment? Lord, if there's anything that we're holding on to, any anger that we have in here this morning, any, any fear, Lord, if we turn on the news and all we can see are stories that just cause us to tremble in fear, Lord, will you cause us to look our eyes on you? Will you do open heart surgery in us in this room right now and cause us to focus on your goodness? Lord, would you give us clarity and direction for our lives? Lord, I pray that you will use this church as a church that is a beacon of your kingdom, not to make a name for the, key, the, the corner's chapel, not to make a name for any individual person, but for you. Lord, give us eyes and hearts that are fully set on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's message. I hope it was a blessing to you. I hope it was an encouragement to you. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will just continue to use these words throughout the week to equip you in your walk with Jesus. If you have any more questions about who we are or how you can get plugged in, uh, be sure to go to our website, thecornerschapel.com. We'd love to hear from you, especially we'd love to hear how we can pray for you. Uh, and if this message was an encouragement to you, I hope that you can share it with someone else and be a blessing to them this week. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe button to see more uh, future sermons and other videos that come out on this channel. And I hope that you have a great week. Be blessed.